And so I think we'll make a start. Firstly, welcome this afternoon to this applicant briefing for this Net Zero Living Pioneer Places competition. This is the agenda for today. I'm going to introduce you to who we have on the call with us today from Innovate, and then we'll take you through the scope and the process sections. At the end of both of these sections, there is a Q&A where you'll have the opportunity to ask any questions related to the scope or the process. Feel free to type the questions as we go through the briefing and we can pick some up as we go along and we'll cover others in the Q&A sessions. So my name is Yvette Willis. I'm the portfolio manager from the competitions team at Innovate for this competition. And I have Cara Cartwright, who's the innovation lead for the Clean Growth team. And we have some other members of the Clean Growth team as well on the call. And Cara will introduce you to those as she covers the scope section of this. So first thing, I'm going to do a quick introduction to Innovate UK and UKRI. So we work with government to invest over £7 billion a year in research and innovation by partnering with academia and industry to make the impossible possible. Through the UK's nine leading academic and industrial funding councils, we create knowledge with impact. So Innovate UK is the UK's innovation agency. We drive productivity and economic growth by supporting businesses to develop and realise the potential of new ideas, including those from UK's world-class research base. Our mission is to help UK businesses grow through the development and commercialisation of new products, processes and services supported by an outstanding innovation ecosystem that's agile, inclusive and easy to navigate. So we firmly believe that innovation is the heart of the UK future growth and prosperity. The UK ranks fourth in the Global Innovation Index and accounts for up to, innovation accounts for up to 50% of productivity. Businesses that consistently invest in R&D have greater productivity and are more likely to export and generate growth. So now I'm going to hand you over to Cara, who's going to talk you through the scope of the competition. Yeah, hi, um, Rob, it's, um, it's you first to give some context to the programme, if that's OK. Sure. Hello, everybody. I'm Rob Saunders. I run the Prospering from the Energy Revolution program in Innovate UK. And I'm just going to give you a bit of background um, before Cara dives into the um, the specifics of the scope. Nilam, I don't know if there's anything we can do about the lobby pinging, but it's quite off-putting, I think, for people. Yeah, unfortunately, because the meeting's already started, we can't switch it off now. OK. Apologies for that, everybody. We'll just have to bear with, I'm afraid. OK, back to this programme. Firstly, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what our new funding is going to be used across our new net zero domain in Innovate UK. So we're running this funding, which is um, going to run across four horizontals of power, heat, make and use, i.e. I, the full cycle of manufacturing, and mobility. And then across those four sectoral themes, there are three cross cutting areas. One is net zero living, which we're talking about today, green finance, and critical circular materials. Within the net zero living portfolio, our vision is for UK places and communities to thrive through their transition to net zero. And in particular, we're going to be running a programme that looks at the demand side of um, decarbonising our places, but also at how we supply the right products and services into that decarbonisation agenda. So we want to um, create thriving places and we also want to create really great user focused products as part of the work we do under this vertical of the net zero domain. So let's take a quick dive into some of the reasons behind why we're running this programme. And at the heart of it is that there's hundred billion pounds worth of opportunities in decarbonising our places. We know that from recent research that's been done. 
The top left of this diagram shows our decarbonisation um, journey by sector over the last few years, last decade or so. The light blue line is power, and we've done pretty well in decarbonising power, but pretty much everything else is fairly flat. And in particular, those top two lines, the pink one and the dark blue one, heat and uh, mobility are really flat. So we're trying to target um, those, and those are inherently local um, phenomena. They need to be done locally uh, to make progress, we think. Um, and not only that, looking at the right hand side of this chart, we also know from research done recently that it's just better to do it um, locally, to take account of local needs and opportunities and to deliver in local specific ways. So if you apply uh, local specific delivery um, to decarbonisation, and these are the uh, the um, blue bars that you can see on the top right chart. You have to spend less. You get much more direct savings from um, decarbonisation, and you create vastly more spillover benefits in um, social uh, in social benefits that you can create in the long term in those places. So we know it's better to do. And if we can take a real lead in this, we also know that there's a vast network of organisations across the globe that we can take advantage of in exporting um, great uh, solutions across the globe in their decarbonisation efforts around the world. But, and this is why we need to run this programme, we can't capture the value from decarbonising our places like that and transitioning to net zero without unlocking a series of non-technical barriers to delivery. So that's what this programme, Net Zero Living, Thriving Places, uh, Pioneer Places, is all about, is unlocking those non-technical barriers to decarbonising our places in the best way possible. Um, this is continuing to be under development, but the bit that we're talking specifically about today is the bit in the red, the red circle top left of this diagram. So this is the first phase of the Pioneer Places programme, which will, we very much hope, have a second phase um, running in about a year's time to develop three to six demonstrators of around £5 million each to show how you really go about unlocking those barriers um, in real life situations in real places around the UK. There is also going to be a fast followers competition um, for about 20 local authorities to to generate a, a strong cohort of places across the country that are uh, on the journey to net zero. And supporting both of those parts of the programme will be a future ready programme incorporating um, tools and capability, shared procurement models, comms and policy, and other, other support packages for local authorities decarbonising their places with their partners in business and, and third, third sectors as well. So just to remind you, this is all this is the whole programme. What we're talking about today is just phase one of the Pioneer Places competition, um, which is the first part of this demonstration programme. Good, so I hope that's just given you a bit of context for um, the, the continuing discussion today. I'm going to hand over back to Cara now to take you through the detailed scope of this phase one of the Pioneer Places competition. Thanks, Rob. So yeah, so hi everybody. So um, I'm going to just talk through now a bit more about the phase one Pioneer Places competition. Um, so what I would say is please do take the time to read the brief in more detail. The slides that I'm presenting are a summary of, of some of the key factors that we're looking for in the applications. Um, so um, I say, so please do read the brief in, in more detail to make sure that you, you pick up on, on all of the points. So, um, so what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to fund um, successful applicants 50 to 75,000 pounds for a period of one to three months to carry out uh, some feasibility work to explore more innovative ways of overcoming those non-technical barriers to help to deliver net zero portfolios. Um, so there's a few elements in terms of there must be a local authority um, engaged within the process. 
um, local authorities do have the, the capability to convene um, a, a huge group of, of stakeholders and, and resources to help deliver net zero in a place. And we're really looking for evidence of senior level support uh, within those authorities um, for, for this funding as well. Um, it's a requirement that you must already have some net zero plans in place and th these activities must be building on those existing plans. Um, they must be innovative. Um, so we are looking for innovative approaches to overcome these uh, non-technical barriers. And equally, these can complement existing um, or potential additional funding sources as well. Um, if uh, if this was is going to help you to to leverage additional funding, that would be looked on on favourably. Um, as Rob's just mentioned as well, this is a potential uh, two phase competition, and so um, those successful applicants would be invited um, for a demonstrator phase. Um, to demonstrate all or, or part of those activities that have been explored during that feasibility um, for funding for up to, up to between five and eight million pounds for maybe three to six places um, so that we can explore in detail um, how effective um, those interventions and innovations are. Oh, presentation has just disappeared. We reupload that. So I'll I'll carry on talking as the slides come on. So um the next slide is really about what we're actually looking for. And there's 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 two key um aspects of, of what we're looking for. That that's the one the scope there. So so firstly, we're looking for applications which are going to take a whole net zero systems approach. Um, again, as, as Rob shared, we have four priority areas of heat, power, mobility and product manufacturing usage. And so we're looking as to how these initiatives and around net zero can come together and be applied in a place and looking at a, a system of systems approach to, to these. Um, and then the second element is looking at the, the difficulties in delivering those those systems approaches um, to, to those net zero projects. And so this is looking at how to address those non-technical barriers. We know that there's so many technical solutions that already exist out there. Um, and so what we're wanting to do is explore innovative solutions around barriers such as financing, capacity, capability and skills, policy and regulation, system governance, uh, data standards, um, strategic grid reinforcement. So these are just some of the examples of the types of non-technical barriers that we would be looking for applicants to explore um, and that there are many more out there that uh, you, could, you could add to that list. And so in the application, we're wanting applicants to demonstrate a good understanding of those barriers and uh, potential solutions to overcome come them. Um, we are also um, going to take a portfolio approach to this competition. Um, given the various degrees of complexity, we, we are looking to have a good representative set of projects that are representative of the UK. So we'll be looking at the barriers, the geographies, the systems and the place types as well. Um, next slide. So in terms of the um, outputs that we're looking for from this feasibility stage, we're looking for a report that covers these factors. And again, there is uh, these are all detailed within the competition brief. Um, so essentially, we're looking for for to make sure that we have plans in place. So we're looking at existing plans and evidence of existing plans. Um, we're looking for that systems approach, but also how you might take any learning and and ideas for unlocking those non-technical barriers um, into a longer term piece of work. So um, so there's longevity um, given to, to your feasibility studies. And we're looking for ideas that would be scalable and replicable um, across the UK so that we can help the UK accelerate its transition to net zero as a whole. Um, within that report, we'd be looking at how you would resource these innovative solutions, how you might deliver them and finance them, um, and how you're actually going to deliver them, what tools you'd, you'd be seeking to use. And really key as well is around how you're thinking within that feasibility of the stakeholders that you need to engage with, um, both in terms of um, 
policy regulators but also communities and making sure that uh, user needs are, are central to some of that thinking and so within that this feasibility phase we're expecting that the applicants would explore all of these areas and apply that to their net zero portfolios okay if you can move to the next slide and just to be clear then so there's a few things that are out of scope for this competition so um, we're not looking at previously unsuccessful projects. Um, if it's not innovative, it, it, it would be out of scope if you can't demonstrate delivery. Um, again, we're not looking for technology based projects here. We are looking for those non technical barriers um, to be funded um, rather than infrastructure projects. We are looking for that whole systems approach, so we must see demonstration of that. Um, and as I've mentioned, we are looking for um, proposals that address the non-technical systemic barriers. They, they must be demonstrated. Um, and there's there's a couple of facts there about we, we cannot fund projects that are dependent on export performance or domestic inputs usage either. Um, I'm just going to hand over now to, to Jody Giles, our, our Head of Innovation for Prospering for the Energy Revolution Challenge, who's going to just share with us some of the experiences that we've had within um, that programme around some of these demonstrator type schemes. Thanks very much, Cara. Um, so my name is Jodie Giles. I'm the Head of Innovation on Prospering from the Energy Revolution. And we've used a lot of the learning from Prospering from the Energy Revolution and other programmes to design this programme. So there's a lot in there that's highly relevant to you now. Um, as a reminder, this was a programme of 93 projects with 301 partners. So we know that collaboration is absolutely crucial. And Rob and Cara have both talked about that. Um, we invested £104 million on this programme, which led to £782 million of co-investment, match funding and equity. So we also know that public finance stimulates that private investment that we are critically going to need in net zero places. Um, we have 72 new products and services that have been developed as part of PIFA, so we also know there's a huge market opportunity here and we can capture the value when we decarbonise our places. So the competition is very much looking that we're talking about today is the first phase of selecting what we hope will be a range of big whole system demonstrators. So what do we mean by big whole system demonstrator projects? Well, if you need some inspiration, please have a look at ESO, LEO and Reflex. They cover heat, mobility, manufacturing and power. Um, but they're very but in this programme, we're very much focusing on those human system barriers that we've talked about. Um, so those systems challenges and collaboration models, we want you to be thinking about renewable electricity generation, flexibility, mobility, heat, but include those broad sets of partnerships and customers that we are going to be serving through our net zero delivery over the next few years. There are lots of more technical um, than human system focused projects in here. Um, but we want you to focus on those human system projects and think about the scale and level of ambition that these projects demonstrate. On Prospering from the Energy Revolution, we also funded um, a number of detailed designs. There's 10 detailed design projects, all of which um, they all have the objective of designing integrated local energy system models fit for a net zero future. These are really good examples of areas that have a plan. So Cara mentioned you've got to have a plan in place already. And we know lots of other areas have plans, so please use those. But these are some examples of plans in place that could lead on to big demonstrator projects and delivery that we want to see. As Rob mentioned and Cara, you know, we're focusing here on, on barriers. And we no, we can capture the value from decarbonising places. We know we can't capture the value from decarbonising places without unlocking the non-technical barriers to delivery. So these include finance, skills and capabilities, policy and regulation, market design, system governance and engagement with people. We can achieve greater value if we integrate across these different vectors and sectors. And we know that local is absolutely key. And um, so, you know, a lot of these processes that are going to be happening are inherently local and we can achieve much greater value if we do those in a place based way. Uh, Cara also mentioned that local authorities are excellent conveners capable of unlocking these barriers 
and bringing together multiple stakeholders in collaboration to do that. And this leads critically to better net zero outcomes for people. So that's very much what we're looking for as the end result. We're going to stop there for some questions and we're going to take 10 minutes of questions before we move on to a best part of this presentation. So if you can raise your hands. Um, Nilam, I can't see who's raising their hands here. Um, I've been collecting the questions. Do you want me to ask questions that have been submitted so far? Oh no, we've got somebody who's raised a hand. Let's start with Anna Lewis. Yeah. Anna, do you want to unmute? Yeah, and ask sorry. Can you, can, you, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, lovely. I did put the question in the chat. Um, one of my first questions is, um, are we able to apply as a local authority um, for this or do we need to partner with somebody who will then apply for us really because obviously we've got a project in mind ourselves. Yeah, you can apply as a local authority and we want you to have partnerships with at least the business yes. as well as some other partners if you can get them. Yeah, we've got that already. When I tried to apply, you know, when, you, when I did the registration, um, and it, it gives you like an option are you a business are you a educate uh, education or public authority um when i clicked on local authority it said that i couldn't apply so i don't know if there's an issue with the <laughs> the um the form in registering thanks there for that was, feedback I, um, sorry there was an issue i believe that's been resolved now so lovely. you should be able to apply now as a local authority lovely thank you Jacob Hall. Hi, sorry, couldn't take myself off mute. Um, uh, yeah, again, my question is in the chat, but it's really the the one to three month time scale is, is very short and quite challenging for what with a couple of projects we're thinking about that we may need to get someone in to help deliver them. And so it was just kind of where that's come from in terms of why such a short time scale and, and whether there would be any. Rob, do you want to take that? Yeah, sure. Um, no, I mean, it's a good question. It is a short time scale. It's it's not really one to three months. I we're expecting these to be three month projects. Really, um, we don't think they're probably achievable in in a month. But this is a feasibility study phase, so we're not expecting you to be demonstrating anything in that time. We are expecting you to be bringing a lot of a lot of existing plans and existing thinking into this, rather than starting from a standing start with zero. Um, the timing of the, the funding is uh, is limited in uh, on our end, so we're trying to squeeze a lot into quite a short time to, time scale anyway. Um, so we we know it's going to be, you know, hard work to um, achieve within that three month time scale, but it's only the feasibility phase of a much longer piece of work and we needed to leave the right amount of time for that demonstrator phase later in the programme. OK, thank you. Hugo Chandler. Hello, it's, it's actually Nick Gibbons. We're sharing a connection from New Resource Partners. There's a couple of references in the presentation and previous information on open data and the importance of open data. And I know notice in the outline on the IFS, there's a bit more explanation of that, but I'm still, it'd be really interesting if you could just give us a bit more and expand a bit more on what, on what, what you're looking for and what you need and um, by way of information and applications and how that might be presented. Are, are there some examples, for instance, of how that might manifest itself? Um, lots of examples on what we're working on on data through the Prospering from the Energy Revolution site. So do have a look at what we've been doing there. But in terms of this programme, Rob, would you like to expand on that a little bit about how that will work? For Nick. Yeah, I'm not quite sure exactly what you're asking about, Hugo. Is there is there anything? Is this about the openness of of the data within your application that you're asking about or how to use open data within your proposal? It's just on the on the slide, on, I think it was uh, about three or four slides back, you were going in the pack, it mentions the importance of open data 
and you know we are a we're, we're a PIFA project in our Liverpool project and we obviously know data is important for technical and non-technical reasons within that project but I was uh, yeah uh, some examples of, of, of kind of what you mean in terms of that requirement because otherwise the outline is broad and sufficiently broad that we think we've got some together with the local authority to bring forward an application but this open data requirement is it about the outcomes of the feasibility study being freely shared across all those stakeholder groups or you know that's yeah I, so I, I think as as part of our PIFA work we've been working really closely with Bayes and Ofchem to try and open up the data in the energy system in particular over the last couple of years through the energy data task force and the energy digitalization task force and we want to make sure we're continuing that journey now clearly we're not asking people to be um, sharing confidential data where that's not appropriate what we do want is for people to take an open data approach wherever possible and to be able to be um, you know creating a learning environment that as many people can um, take part in as possible so you know part of the broader program will be to share learnings and data wherever, wherever possible. Um, so I think we're just looking for an acknowledgement of that within the uh, proposals that we get and a plan for how, how you'll be um, incorporating that approach in your work. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Nick. Um, Marcia Jones. Hi, um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on the manufacturing element of this. I think, are you talking about manufacturers within that place or is it people manufacturing um, goods that would contribute to the net zero? Just wanted to make sure I understood that that element correctly. Yeah, definitely, I would say within a place and um, Obviously, for net zero, we're going to be manufacturing things in very different ways, in net zero ways to create net zero places. Rob, is there anything you want to add on that, or Cara? Yeah, I was just going to add um, also within that project product manufacturing usage, it's that it is that whole product life cycle. So um, to include kind of waste and recycling, as well as working with industry in terms of um, manufacturing within within a place as well. So if it's not too cheeky, then follow. So you think in more circular economy and and their contribution then to achieve a net zero within that place, possibly as providers, I don't know, state, waste heat yeah. or so. OK, great. Thank you. Yeah, just just to be clear, you know, all of that is is absolutely within scope. What what is not in scope is kind of industrial decarbonisation. So we're not we're not interested in what goes on inside a factory. Um, to decarbonise that factory, but we are really interested potentially in how an industrial complex might interact with the broader city as part of a decarbonisation plan, how the inputs and outputs of, a, of an industrial plant might work as part of a, the decarbonisation of that plan, of that place overall. Great, that no, that's sense. much clearer. Thanks very much, Rob. Bye. Libby Watts. Hi, thank you. Um, just a, a bit of a clarification around the technical, non-technical um, references. When you say when you say non-technical, is that just for the first phase, um, or is that for the entire both phases? I'm just wondering if you're looking at something hypothetically. If you're looking at something like community energy, I'm guessing your first phase is going to all be about communities, behavioural change, all that. I think the second phase would be more about implementing it, or am I completely getting it wrong? Uh, no, kind of it is across. No, if if the not if the technical, yeah, it, looking... to me technical would be you know community energy would be not primarily technical but very much technical, and and I'm just wondering where it all fits in. Yeah, we're looking for the non-technical across a human system barrier removal across phase one and two. Um, and there may be, you know, if you're doing a big demonstrator project, there might be a technical element to that. But we would only want to see that as a small element of the programme because we are looking at the, those human system barriers that we've outlined. 
Cara, Rob, is there anything you want to add on those on those points? Yeah, I was just going to add that um, for this for these pioneers, what we're looking for is that you're you're looking at how to deliver existing plans. So um, the those solutions would be within your plan and, and and funded. So therefore, we're not looking to fund that the technical aspects, but it's more about how you could do that differently to deliver those more effectively. Is is what we're we're really looking at. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you, Mary Louise Harrison. Hi, yes, good afternoon. Um, yeah, my, my question is, is quite a simple one. I'm sort of thinking about what type of business that we should be inviting to um, work with us on this project. As, as a, an enterprise partnership, we have a, you know, a significant number of businesses, um, but I'm just sort of looking to which one would be the best one to approach. Does that make sense? So this Hi. is about net zero delivery. And yeah. um, it's quite likely that we are expecting consortiums to come forward of businesses that have already been working together yeah. with local authorities, because it's quite likely, given the timescales, that you will have already been working on your plan together. Um, and that's the kind of collaboration we would like to see. Yeah, no, um, we, we, sorry, we, we have got businesses that we've been working with I'm just debating in my head based on what you've been saying about the non-technical etc which is the best business to but okay I'll I'll try and figure it out yeah I'm sorry I don't know the detail of your place and I wouldn't be able to tell you which of the best businesses in your area to work with um, but you need to think about the impacts and the outcomes and what you're trying to achieve and, and work with the businesses who are going to help you deliver that yeah, I, think I, I, I would just sorry I'd just add at yeah. that stage that um, where this competition is all about phase one we do recognize that you know if you're invited to that phase two stage that you may wish to change your partners in, increase your collaborations and so on so at the minute it's about looking at kind of who are the right partners to do that really effective feasibility um, and the, there's always time um, to, 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 to change those partnerships um, if, if need be as well. Ah, oh, now that makes more sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, that makes yeah. more sense. Okay. Family. Yeah. Hi. Thank you for the pres presentation. Just got a quick clarification. When you talk about mobility, is that around kind of physical transport? And also, when we talk about mobility, does digital connectivity kind of falls into that remit as well? Sorry. Did you say digital? Yeah. Digital connectivity. Yeah. So I think that? in terms of mobility, we're, we're looking at all types of transport systems and infrastructure and how that fits into a place and um, and that journey to net zero. So whether that's um, providing you know greener transport options for people or whether that's decarbonising existing transport options in terms of the digital, obviously, without knowing a bit more detail, it's quite difficult to comment. But if there are digital solutions which are helping um, mobility solutions to be lower carbon, then um, that that would certainly be something that we, we, we would consider. Sorry, just to clarify the question, I guess it's very much around digital provision so people don't need to travel, you know, yeah. reducing. So those would be within scope. If that's part of a wider systems yeah. approach, then um, then then yeah, that would be considered. It might be worth if, if you want to um, email us at yeah. there's an email address at the end. We can have a look at maybe a more detailed um, description if that would help. Thanks. Um, we'll take one final question before we move on. Um, but please do, everyone else who've got your hand up, please do post your questions in the chat. Rosario, Rosario Norris. Sorry, we can't hear you. OK, if you would like to post yeah. your... Um. Good afternoon, panel. Uh, would you say this part of the competition is related to just the basic the business concepts and those type of uh, non-technical issues you'd encounter when you are developing a business concept of some type? This isn't about individual business concepts. It's about whole system integration and collaboration across 
different vectors and sectors to achieve net zero. So I wouldn't say it's about one. No, I mean, I, I mean, I'm referring to a concept that would um, establish those uh, those all of those areas. Um, but I mean, I'm just trying to establish what it is you're looking for in terms of, um, like, for example, if you say um, the non-technical uh, barriers, would that relate be related to IP status of your innovation? Would that be an example of? Um, Sarah, do you want to respond on that? Yeah. Yeah, so so I think um, we're we're more looking at kind of those barriers that are, are preventing places from really accelerating their transition to net zero. So we might be looking at kind of um, are there barriers around commercial arrangements? Are there barriers around attracting finance into a place to to deliver to deliver portfolios? Um, are there um, barriers around procurement, for example, maybe not quite specifically about IP of a particular product, but if uh, if commercial policies between, say, local authorities and businesses, uh, uh, if the IP is a barrier within those commercial policies, then that that could be an area um, that, that that is explored. Thank you very much for your help. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank we're going to move on now to the next part of the presentations from Yvette. Um, thanks very much for your questions. As I say, keep quite posting those questions in the chat and we'll do our best to answer them. Thank you. Thank you. And there will be hopefully at the end the opportunity to pick up some more questions um, as long as we've got some time. So yeah, I'm just going to run you through the briefly through the eligibility and then through some of the process of how to apply into this competition. So this competition does not allow you to submit any form of previously submitted application. Um, so for this competition, the project costs, as Cara has already said, range between 50 to 75,000 pounds and the project should be between one and three months in length. To lead a project, you must be a local authority or a UK registered business and the project must be collaborative. And as Cara referenced, there are some other bits around the um, eligibility as regards having an existing um, net zero plan. <clears throat> so these are the types of organisation that innovate UK funds. Um, and so, as I previously said, applying into the competition, the lead part needs to be a UK local authority or UK registered business. And collaborative partners can be any of these organisation types. And for this competition, that includes utilities and regulators, local authorities, community groups, health authorities, education establishments, and energy network operators. And also in this competition, we welcome collaborative applications between multiple authorities. So I've got a couple of <clears throat> slides to share with you on um, subsidy control. I'm aware they're very busy with a lot of information on them, but you will get this slide deck at the end of this <clears throat> briefing. So I'm not going to take you through these slides word for word. You'll be very glad to know. But in summary, the UK left the EU in January of 2021 and is no longer subject to EU laws on state aid. So on this slide, you can see a link to the guidance that's issued by Bayes. If you're unsure of whether you're, you are eligible to receive a subsidy, please seek legal advice. Further information is available on our website and you can also contact our customer support team if you have any questions. So a going concern is a business that has assumed will meet its financial obligations when they fall due. It functions without the threat of liquidation for the foreseeable future. You should make sure your organisation is um, eligible before you submit an application. And again, if you need any further information, it's available on our website and via our customer support team. And if you're an applicant who is conducting activities that will affect the trade of goods between Northern Ireland and the EU, as envisaged by Article 10 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, then you must apply under European Commission state aid rules. In order to receive state aid, you must pass the undertakings in difficulty test. This only applies to limited liability companies that are more than three years old. <clears throat> if you have a parent company, the test can be performed on your parent or holding company. If you're successful in the competition, we will apply this test as part of our viability checks. And again, further information is available through our website and through our customer support team. So these are the funding rates which are available in this competition, and it depends on the type of organisation 
that you are. So 20% of the total project costs must be incurred by a business. If you have an academic or an RTO in your consortium, the maximum level of project cost they can claim is 80%. And if there's more than one, they would share that 80% between them. So again, some sort of quite specific um, rule which applies to this competition around research organisations um, and whether you're acting commercially or not. Again, this is if you have queries around this, it's best to send them in by email to our customer support team who will be able to answer them for you. So there must be evidence of genuine collaboration in your project. You'll need to explain in your application how all parties will contribute to the project and benefit from the collaboration. And for this competition, the term local authority, which you can see at the bottom, includes county councils, district councils, unitary authorities, metropolitan metropolitan districts and London boroughs. Regional collaborations coordinated through bodies such as combined authorities are also eligible. A local authority or business can only lead on one application but can be included as a collaborator in a, in a further single application. If an organisation is not leading any application, it can collaborate in any number of applications. Just to point out some other information to be aware of, if you or your organization, any organisation in your consortium previously failed to submit an independent accountant's report or having an, have an outstanding final claim on a live Innovate project, we will not award further funding to you in this or any other competition until we've received the documents. Additionally, if you were awarded funding in a previous Innovate competition but didn't sufficiently exploit the award, we will award no more funding to you. So these are the key dates to bear in mind for this competition and it's important to note that the submission deadline is 11 a.m on the dot. IFS will automatically close and so at 11.01 applications can't be submitted. We strongly recommend that you submit your application as early as possible on deadline day as traffic will get very busy leading up to that deadline. And please contact customer support in advance of the deadline if you're experiencing any difficulties submitting your application so that we can assist you in good time. I'm going to look at the Innovation Funding Service now. So when you click Apply on the competition web page, you'll be directed here. Use the keyword search to find the competition you're interested in. Click the title, then it opens the competition. If you click on the competition to see a tabbed view of the eligibility criteria, <clears throat> the scope, the key dates and information on how to apply. And when you're happy, simply click Start New Application. To apply for a competition, the lead applicant will need to create an account. If you've previously applied for competitions in IFS, you can simply sign in. If you've forgotten your password, please click on the Need Help Signing In or Creating an Account drop-down, and this will then bring up a Forgotten Your Password link. You can use the company's house lookup to search for your organisation to save typing in the name and address. If you're not on Companies House, you can manually enter your information. We do advise that research organisations and academic and universities manually enter your information <clears throat> so that you're not listed as a business on IFS, which will ensure you receive the correct funding rate. So this is an overview of the first section, which is the project details. <clears throat> so in application details, please make sure your research category is correct, as this is used to calculate your grant value. The project summary highlights the need or challenge, the approach and innovation, and the key to outcomes. This is the key to setting the scene for the assessors as it gives them an overview of your vision. Public description is published if your project is successful, so please be aware of confidentiality here. And then within scope, it's important that your, your project is within scope to receive funding. So please use this field to justify how your project fits the scope for the assessors. If you're unsure as to whether or not your application is in scope for this competition, please contact customer support. Section two is the application questions. There are 10 scored questions and they can be found under the how to apply tab. Very detailed guidance is associated with each question on IFS and you can see that five of the questions allow for appendices to be uploaded. 
So to claim funding, your business doesn't have to be UK registered with Companies House when you apply, but it must be registered before you can receive funding. And there are just a few exclusions, um, which mean you're unable to claim funding. So if your company number begins with FC, BR, ML, if you're based in Jersey, so beginning with JE, based in Guernsey or the Isle of Man. And you're also unable to claim funding if your company is based in any of these British overseas territories. So within each project, there are a number of cost categories that you'll need to complete. So within labour, you need to enter the role within the project, the gross annual salary, the number of staff and the days to be spent on the project. It will then automatically calculate the total costs. If you have multiple people in the same role on the same average salary, enter this in the role within project field. If an employee is part time, you should enter their costs as a full time equivalent. You can adjust the working days per year from the default if this is different for your project. Please note that dividends, bonuses and non-productive time cannot be included within your labour costs as they are ineligible. When making grant claims against labour costs, actual costs claimed must be supported with timesheets. So you need to enter and describe what materials you intend to use on the project, the volume and the cost. The materials listed must be project specific. Please provide as much information as possible. For example, just putting consumables at £50,000 doesn't provide enough detail and you'll be required to provide more information from the project finance team if you are successful. Any items which you would usually, which you would usually depreciate as per your company's policy should be listed in capital usage. Materials supplied by associated companies or subcontracted from any other consortium members must be listed at cost, excluding any profit element or margin. If your subcontractor cost is going to be significant, you'll need to justify who, why and what you need them for, both here and in your application. It's important that you justify the use of subcontractors within your application, as these, the assessors do not see this level of financial detail, they only see the total cost. If you use a parent or sister company, please ensure you list at cost and do not include profit. So here you would include things such as essential meetings that need to happen during the project. You cannot include any sales or marketing activity as this is ineligible. Travel, travel costs must be at economy travel only. You should be prepared to provide a breakdown of these costs if the project finance reviewer asks for more detail. We define overheads as additional costs and operational expenses incurred directly as a result of the project. These could include additional costs for administrative staff, general IT, rent and utilities. You can select from the three options you can see on the screen how you would like your overheads calculated. We class indirect overheads as those costs associated with back office functions such as finance or HR whose primary function is to support the running of a business. They can only claim a portion of their time and their work needs to be additional to to the delivery of the project and not business as usual. Typically, these costs are not directly related to a particular product or service production. Direct overheads are costs associated with staff working directly on the project, for example, laptops, desks and office facilities. We supply a simple form into which you can list out each type of direct overhead together with the methodology and basis of apportionment to this particular project. Again, these overheads would not be inc incurred if the project doesn't happen. Here on your, you'll need to describe how you're using the equipment, whether it's new or existing, the new purchase cost, how long you're depreciating it over and the residual value at the end. These calculations will need to be in line with your accounting practices. And other costs are for um, costs that, as the name suggests, don't automatically fit into the other categories. But please be aware of double counting and make sure that costs included in other can be justified. So this is a summary of the project costs available to all organisations in the project. You'll not be able to see any more detail or breakdown of anyone else's costs and this is also what the assessors will see. As previously mentioned, the level of funding awarded will depend upon the type of organisation and the type of research being undertaken in the project. IFS will calculate your grant percentage based on the answers that you previously input.
And again, this is just a summary reminder of the levels of funding available, depending on the organisation type. So academic partners in your consortium will need to complete a JES form, which they should be familiar with. The form validates costs for us. Innovate UK don't have access to the JES system to extract information ourselves, which is why this needs to be sent to us separately. When they've completed their JES form, academics will need to include their unique reference number on IFS and input their figures. Please ensure the figures you provide are identical. The form must be with council status and uploaded to IFS as a PDF. For collaborative applications, <clears throat> IFS will highlight to the lead applicant any partners who have outstanding project finances to complete. All finances must be included in the application before the lead applicant can submit. It will also check that your research participation costs are within the required limits. However, IFS does not validate project costs. It's your responsibility to ensure that all costs are within the eligible total project costs as stated in the brief. If you find you want to edit your application once it's been submitted, then this is possible ahead of the submission deadline. First, you need to reopen your application. On your IFS dashboard, you'll see the option to reopen <clears throat> as shown in the slide. The option is also visible on your application status page. Once reopened, you can make changes to your application, but when you've finished, please remember to resubmit. Just click on the green Review and Submit button, review your application once more, and then click the Final Submit button. Just a, a quick one for your interest, really. We're able to track site usage and submission uploads. This table shows the number of applicants submitting their proposals each hour leading up to what was a noon deadline in a previous competition. As you can see, the majority of applicants leave it to the final hours. We strongly recommend submitting your application early to avoid any last minute technical issues. But Innovate UK have produced a series of five videos to take you through the assessment process. We've selected two to include in this briefing, which will explain how our assessors assess your applications and how applications are selected for funding. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel for other helpful hints and tips about the application process.
So if you are successful in this, this competition, you'll be design, assigned a delivery executive who will guide you through the project setup process. You'll have seven days to complete the project team, project details and bank details, and then have up to 90 days to complete the project setup. And if you are unsuccessful in this competition, you may be able to use the assessor's feedback to develop your idea and apply into another competition that allows previously submitted applications. During project setup, all communication will be through IFS and the lead applicant must provide collaboration agreements and exploitation plans if applicable. And then during the project delivery, there's just some information here about um, the payment of grants and the kind of paperwork and information that will be needed on an ongoing basis, including the monitoring of the projects. So at Innovate, we're on a mission to embed equality, diversity and inclusion in everything we do. We believe that great ideas can and do come from anyone and everyone. Diversity in all its many forms matters. Evidence shows that diversity and inclusion in businesses contributes to enhanced innovation, satisfaction, performance and ultimately commercial success. So we welcome and encourage applications from people of all backgrounds and are committed to making our application process accessible to everyone, which is why we're developing our process and systems to ensure equitable access. This includes providing support for people who have a disability or long term condition and face barriers applying to us. So if you have a condition that means that you do have barriers facing you, and you would like support, please contact our customer support service on the email address or the telephone number that are on the screen. <clears throat> and those contact details will be um, up again in just a minute when I finished. So just to give you an idea of what to expect once you reach out to us, we've outlined the steps on this slide. So first you'd contact our customer support team. Um, we recommend you do so as early as possible, ideally at least 15 working days before the deadline. So together with the customer support team or in your own time, you'll complete a request form, which will then be sent to our partner, Diversity and Ability. Diversity and Ability will then conduct a discovery conversation with you and make reasonable adjustments and recommendations. And as a result, they will organise and deliver a bespoke reasonable adjustments for and with you. An example of this could be a couple of hours focused on reading through the questions, spell checking your work, helping with planning and time management, just to name a few. Then you submit your application. Once again, please make sure to give plenty of time before the deadline, especially as the, it is a hard deadline on IFS and no extensions can be granted under any circumstances. So if you'd like some support, please give our customer support team a ring. So ideally, sort of 15 working days or so before the competition closes. If your consortium has an SME in it, an Innovate Edge will offer support to them. Edge empower innovation driven businesses to grow at pace and achieve their ambitions. Once you engage, engage with Edge, a dedicated innovation and growth specialist will work closely and efficiently with your leadership team to gain an intimate understanding of your needs. And again, I've got one a short video to show you on Edge and then we can pick up with more of the questions that you've been asking. Okay, so I'm going to go back to say questions that you've been asking as we've gone through. I'll leave this slide on the screen, which has got 
various contact details for you so you can make a note of um, but as we said we will share these slides afterwards so i'm going to hand back to the um to the team Thanks, Yvette. So we have got a little bit of time to take some more questions if there are any. So please do raise your hand if you have questions from Yvette's presentation. And if you don't have questions from Yvette's presentation, if you've got questions from earlier and you'd like to use this time now to, to ask us, then you're more than welcome to do that as well. Let's start with Donna Waship. Hi, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, <clears throat> just going back to a question that was raised in the chat, really. Um, in terms of innovation, are you, because it, it sort of really stresses it's got to be an innovative proposal, are you defining that as something that's sort of not been done anywhere in the UK before? Because, um, you know, some of the barriers that we'd be looking to address, I think some of the solutions are being trialled in certain places, but those are very recent developments and only just being put in place. So I just wondered how innovative is innovative? question. Thank you, Donna. Um, Clara, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, so so we are looking for anything new. So um, yeah, so so things that aren't currently being um, delivered and, and implemented um, across the UK. Um, I say we are looking for, for new ideas that could be a new process, a new approach. Um, yeah, um, so uh, yeah, anything that's new and different is, is what we're looking for. So sorry, just to be cheeky and just have a, a, a follow up. So something like net zero neighbourhoods and the approach that's just been adopted in the West Midlands Combined Authority, if another authority as part of their pro process wanted to pr propose something similar to that, it would unlikely to be considered innovative. If you were proposing a build and there was something different about what you were suggesting, then that would um, yeah, that would be looked at by by this competition. If it was merely replicating a model that has been um, is being trialled somewhere else, then then no, that wouldn't be within scope. OK, thank you. Ian Bowers. Thank you. <clears throat> thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I'm, I'm actually on the Innovation Funding Service website right now, trying to sign in as a local authority, and it kind of won't let me. So you know, there's, there's a drop down menu which says select the type of business that you are, that is going to lead the application. So if I move on from that and I put in my council name, which is Baber and Mid Suffolk District Council, it comes up with thousands of um, responses, but obviously we don't have a registration number and this seems to be linked through to company's house. And um, yeah, it comes up with 333,438 possibilities. Thanks Ian, <laughs> now, if you can um, send that issue to customer support services, they'll help you resolve that. Uh, um, innovate, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Carol, thank you. Carol Randall. Hi, um, so we've had some clarity around the various different kind of categories, mobility, heat, energy and so forth. Um, but what my question is around, there are a number of non-technical barriers cited in the uh, guidance documentation. Would we need to be looking at all of those or a subset of those in our proposals? Rob, would you like to pick that one up? Sure. Yeah, good question. Um, you need to do what is the appropriate thing for the place, for your place and your decarbonisation plan. So places are all different and they'll all have different needs. And the so the proportion of those different sectors will be different in different places. Some places, for instance, will be much more industrial than others. So the, you know, the make and use part of the project or the or the decarbonisation scope will vary in that respect as an example you may also want to include 
other parts of the net zero solution that aren't one of those four uh, call outs. So, for example, you know, agri-tech, agriculture and land use might be a part of your solution as well. We we haven't got that on that original chart because it's not an area that's being funded a lot under our net zero domain. But you need to you need to apply based on what is needed to get your place to net zero. And similarly, from the barriers perspective, you need to apply prioritizing the barriers that are most pertinent to delivering that plan in your local area. And that's not going to include all of those barriers necessarily in all places, but you need to demonstrate that you know which of the barriers that are really important and that you understand which are the priorities and that you're going to go after those. Fantastic, thank you. And a cheeky follow up question mm -hmm. in the guidance. Sorry, sorry, Carol, um, I'm going to move on because there's loads of people who've got questions here. So Lorenza, if you can type it in the chat, that'd be great. Lorenza Cassini. Um, my question is probably related to similarly to the first one to from Donna. So in the landscape the local authorities, when we're talking about combined authorities, um, would would yourselves consider applications that are coming from the combined authorities and individual borrow separately if the two are complementary? So not quite quite the opposite of what Donna was saying earlier, you know, and, and what I think Cara, you gave the answer is if they are complementary, so they're not repeating and they're not the same. Would you consider them if they're coming, obviously, you know, as proposals um, from from two entities, from two submissions? Thank you. Sarah, do you want to? You've already kind of answered that, so do you want to pick that up? Yeah. So, so again, I think there's sort of two elements to that. So, um, one one is in terms of, I guess, the number of applications that that, that you can put in. So, if a local authority is a lead applicant, then um, they can collaborate on on one more. Um, one more application um, and so the thinking behind that because I've, I've seen a few questions around that as well is that if you are successful in more than one of your applications um, we would like confidence that you can deliver and, and resource that as well so that was that was part of our thinking behind that in terms of the um, piece about if it's a complementary idea to something that's already happening again if you can demonstrate that what you are doing is innovative and different to what is already out there then um, then then that would be um, something that we would consider thank you smart uh, smart Could I ask your thoughts on focusing on one vector? And I'm thinking specifically hydrogen, which would cut across the entire energy system. But would you welcome applications that focused on that? Would you like to answer that? Hi, Marta. Um, uh, we, we think, I mean, a bit like my previous answer, your, your plan needs to be about decarbonising a place across mm -hmm. all of its needs. I I mean, I think it's unlikely that hydrogen, hydrogen alone is going to provide that answer. If yeah, I guess if you if you're in a local authority really think that's the, that's the answer to all all the places needs, then you you could apply with that. Um, it, it still has to work across. You know, you could imagine scenarios that work across heat power and mobility um, with hydrogen playing into all of those, I think. It, it seems unlikely that's going to um, get to the, to the right end point from where I'm sitting, but that's not up to me. OK, OK, no, thank you. That helps clarify. Thanks. Cheers. Um, we've got 271 people on this call. There's a Ben who wants to ask a question. I'm conscious there's going to be a lot of Ben. So Ben, who's put the hand up, please, could you ask your question? Hi, uh, <clears throat> I think that's me. Um, this might be more of a question to have internally, and I think I think someone's already raised it in the chat, so I'm sorry if it's been covered. But from a local authority procurement perspective, I don't know whether you have any insight on if we're going for a bid with a business partner, how does that work with the general procurement principles? Because, of course, we don't want to fall foul of anything. So I'm not yeah. sure one in the chat might even be better to provide guidance on that. Yeah, so we're not expecting you to have procured anything. It's a feasibility competition. So um, 
for uh, Rob, do you want to add anything on that? Yeah, so I think for, for our pioneers um, for this for this competition, what we're looking for is where you've got existing relationships and your existing portfolio that you're going to be building on. Um, so I guess when we have designed this competition, we're not expecting for this stage that you would be looking to particularly procure a partner to work with. Um, it may well be that you know, should you be successful and, and potentially be invited to a, a phase two at that stage, if there was procurement involved, that would be detailed within your, your feasibility report and, and potential application um, as well moving forwards. OK, yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Chika Udeja. Oh, hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I, I know this might have been covered earlier. Uh, the, my question is, if you're a business and local authority in a particular locality, can you work with a university outside that locality? Sorry, I didn't catch the rest of that question. So I'm saying uh, if you're a local authority and a business in a particular locality, can you work with a university outside that locality or does it have to be the same university, should it be a university within that same locality to make it look like you're talking about places uh, uh, and the carbonization of that place? You, could, you, can, you can work with partners um, out, outside of the, the place that you're looking to um, either decarbonize or achieve net zero for. So yeah, if you've got uh, partnerships with universities, um, then um, if you're drawing on the right expertise that that helps you to deliver your solution. That that's what we're looking for. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Stephen Carr. Hi, uh, it was just to confirm. So the innovation you're looking for is not around the kind of net zero project itself or the net zero plan. It's it's the innovation around how you overcome the non-technical barriers, which is the key. Just to make sure I'm understanding that right. Yes. And in terms of feasibility, then you're looking for a feasibility study, which kind of says how feasible it is to overcome these net zero barriers. Yeah, so the, the feasibility would cover um, looking at, at the net zero portfolio, looking at whether whether that's a single project, whether that's multiple projects and, and taking that looking at um, a place based approach and, and, the, and the relevant factors and then saying, well, what are the those non-technical barriers that are preventing us from delivering this effectively? Or if we could overcome some barriers, could we deliver these much more effectively? Um, and what would those solutions therefore look like? So you'll have some ideas when you put your application and the feasibility is to develop those ideas um, further with a view to potentially being able to, to implement and deliver those. And you want that net zero project to already be in place or to be well developed? Yes. To, to space around. OK, that's great. That's that was all my questions. Thank you. Robin Cooper English. After. Um, so I'm uh, attending on behalf of uh, University of York and we're in consultation uh, with a local authority. Just to double check, we would also need a business then as well to be working with us. Yes. Super. What role do you kind of envisage the businesses playing in that? Um, obviously, you're talking about the kind of local authorities being great conveners and everything, and there's a number of businesses we'd like to engage with, but obviously um, we'd engage them as stakeholders, not necessarily as partners. How how do we pick our partner kind of thing, I guess, is my question. So we've outlined um, why business is critical to attracting private sector finance to these types of projects. Um, so you might want to to think about that. Um, Cara, Rob, anything to add on that? Again, I'd just go back to, you know, we're, we're, lo we're looking for proposals that build on existing projects and programmes and portfolios. And so therefore we'd be looking or we'd expect you to be looking for, for business partners that are going to be helping you either to deliver that or to, to deliver that in a different way. So, um, so yeah, so building on on existing relationships is, is is what I would have expected but it's dependent on your your place your project as well as to to who the the right business partner would would be thanks 
And think about delivery potential as well, like a lot of the more advanced local authorities delivering net zero place based innovations are doing so in partnership with businesses who have the capacity and the expertise to support that delivery. Um, so think about that. Grace Couch. Hello, sorry. Um, I, yeah, I guess it was just a question around um, whether Innovate UK is able to provide a kind of matchmaking service as such to to, to interested local authorities in a in a similar area or businesses or universities, or whether if those relationships aren't already in place at this stage, there's not much point looking to submit something by the deadline in a month's time. So, so we haven't got anything in terms of to, to match make at this point in time. However, um, the KTN website address um, is on the screen. Our KTN colleagues um, are, are on the call at the moment. Um, they may be able to assist you in terms of um, in, in terms of reaching out to, to other organisations or authorities. Morgan okay. Price. Thank you. Morgan. I think it's Samantha. Ah, thanks. Yes, that happens all the time. Don't worry. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I can just see Morgan Price. Like Morgan Price, <laughs> the wrong, wrong way around. Samantha. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, so it's it's going back to the what what kind of um proposal will will fit with your criteria. But um, we, if we have identified a new model that would help us deliver various. Um, a range of our different strategies, so electric vehicles, uh, well, aggress uh, across um, residents, power, um, and mobility. But, but those those things are already in existing, and we do have those defined in, in a signed off strategy. But this model is is new. Is that um, within the scope? It sounds like it, but you need I to think about how you're going to deliver those. You know, this is a feasibility for a large scale demonstrator. And if you've already got funding to deliver bits of those, think about which bits you haven't got funding for that is this funding is going to add that additionality. I'll also add, obviously, in terms of a lot of these scope calls that, you know, if, if you do want any further clarification, then um, by by writing into our customer services, um, myself and the team will we'll, we'll respond to those as well if, if if you wanted to provide more detail. Great. OK, thanks. Carol Wandel, looks like we've got time for that cheeky second question, if you'd like to ask it. OK, thank you very much. So my cheeky second question was going to be um, in some of the guidance you talk about uh, need us needing to describe which net zero tool we're going to be tool or tools we're going to be using. Um, there are an awful lot of net zero tools out there. Um, are there some that you recognise, some that you don't? Um, what, what's your thinking on that? We've funded a lot of net zero tools. So what we don't where I was going, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what we don't want is um kind of replication or reinventing of the wheel. So um if it exists, we want to see that you're using it if it's appropriate for your place. Cara? Yeah, so um, so no, we don't have a, a list of like approved tools or products that that we're we're marking people against. Um, but but yeah, we we do want to see that that you know that that the applicants are aware of which tools are out there and which ones would be relevant to support that proposal. Okay, thank you, Helen Huma. Thanks. Um, there's a, a few comments in the chat and I'm also wondering too is how how do local authorities partner with a business if we don't have time to do the um, public procurement in the application deadline? Do you have any guidance on how we'd be able to kind of partner with a business um, whilst also complying with procurement rules? Like I said earlier this is a feasibility competition we're not expecting you to have procured any kind of particular service from a business that you will be working with. We're looking for you to collaborate with existing um, partners that you are already working with towards delivering your net zero plans for a place. Cara, Rob, is there anything you want to add on that? I was, I was just going to add that kind of 
it might not be clear what the mechanism of funding, uh, how that works, but we would be funding a local authority and a business both directly from Innovate UK. We'd be paying both parties directly. So there's no need for you to procure a business and pay, you know, th for the payment to go through you. This would be a collaboration between you and a business where both uh, both would be funded independently, but as part of a joint project. Does that does that help? And so that just to kind of clarify, so we could pick a business then and submit an application with them as a collaborator, and because the funding was going via Innovate UK directly to that business, not through us as the local authority, we wouldn't have to do any kind of procurement. Well, you need to you need to comply with your procurement um, regulations or your your partner selection. Um, uh, you know, governance requirements. We can't, I'm afraid, you know, uh, do that for you, but this isn't as far as we see it, we're funding you and the business in a collaboration in a collaboration around a feasibility study. Um, so we don't think that um, you need to go through any procurement to do that. But you should check that out yourself, of course. Yeah, we we are accepting subcontractors if that is appropriate, but we are keeping. Yeah, the, there are both mechanisms there. Okay, we've got two minutes left, so one final question from James Noakes, if it's a quick one. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to get too bogged down in procurement, but unfortunately we may well end up being bogged down in it. Um, I, speak, I suppose the issue is that it's not an insurmountable task to go through procurement if need be, because sometimes you have to go through procurement even if we're not providing funding ourselves. Um, clearly, a business will only be able to take advantage of this if it partners with us. So we have to demonstrate, you know, the processes we've been through uh, for partnering. I suppose just from our own experience, many in local authorities, it's the short time period of being able to to get that through. Did you have a question, James? No, I, I kind of wanted to make that point. I'm just wondering why it has to be such such a short time period. All right, so Rob has answered the timescale one already, so um, we'll send you all the recording and all of the notes and slides from this. Um, Cara, Rob, um, is there anything else, Yvette, is there anything else you'd like to say in summing, summing up? No, I don't think so. Thank you everybody for attending and like I say, we'll send the recording slides and yeah, good luck with your applications. Thanks everyone. Cheers everyone, good luck. Bye. Bye. Bye.